Hey, welcome back! Getting to the ninth episode of the stocks you recommended. Really quick, any suggestion, please leave a comment. Also, please make sure to check out the other episodes in the series, we found a bunch of good companies so far. Once again, we have a diversified set of interesting companies, so let's get into it. To begin with Monster, I'm sure everyone knows them. They are an energy drink company whose stock had one of the best performances on the planet since the early 2000s. The stock is now down to some of the lowest prices in the past year after falling about 20% from its peak. They have a bunch of brands in the sector, but for now Monster remains the main source of income. We can see a very solid increase in revenue over the past half a decade, but the net income and the cash flow didn't really move. There is a significant increase in capex lately and overall they should make around 1.3 to 1.5 billion right now. For a 50 billion market cap, that's a ratio of around 35, which is pretty much the average for Monster. There is a good reason for such a ratio, as you are about to see in a second, but it doesn't mean it can't change in the future. You know, there are companies that make more money and have more potential to grow valued at much less than 50 billion, so keep that in mind. Financially, they are in an excellent position with pretty much zero debt and very low current liabilities. So, you get 10 billion in equity on a 50 billion market cap, but the equity isn't really relevant with a company like this. If it was a minor, sure, but when brands and stuff are involved, it's different. Anyway, such a healthy balance sheet offers a huge amount of flexibility and they really don't care about whatever the Fed is doing. Sure, it can influence the clients and the final consumer, so rate cuts will be beneficial. Obviously, that will always come with a premium and it's well deserved. Recently, they bought back about 3 billion worth of shares or around 5% of the company. I don't think that was such a good move because 3 billion for them is a lot of money. It's the capex for about 15 years and it could have been spent much better right now. Sure, there is no debt to worry about, but why not just buy a competitor instead or invest in anything else? But I think and I hope that they plan some kind of acquisition in the near future and maybe this is the reason. You know, they would probably issue stocks to buy another company, so the higher the price of the stock, the better. Otherwise, it's a pretty bad decision. I think there is also a bit of potential to maybe see Pepsi or Coca-Cola buy them, although it wouldn't be cheap, if they want to develop into the industry. Coca-Cola tried something, but I don't think it's that successful, but Pepsi has a few successful brands in the sector. But this is also a downside. There is a lot of competition and some of the companies that they have to fight are many times bigger and have nearly unlimited budgets in comparison. But even with all the competition, they developed into what they are today, so it's not like some tech company that had a monopoly for a few years and now has to adapt to competition. And again, they have the balance sheet to potentially fight if they have to. And finally, one issue that I have with the company is the potential to grow. You already have Monster or a cheaper brand that they own in 158 countries. When they reach a more mature state in these countries, other than whatever the energy drink market will grow, they'll have very little organic potential. They can have as many brand ambassadors and champions as they want, many of which probably don't even drink Monster, but the potential is limited. Even the recommended maximum dose is something like 2 per day, so eventually they hit kind of a ceiling. It can be in 5 years, 10, but when it happens, if they don't do something, that can affect the stock. What they can do, however, is expand into things like sport drinks or other kind of beverages or products. But that takes money or issuing stock and especially time, and it's a matter of management having the long-term vision needed. So this is more about how much you can trust the management to do the right thing instead of focusing on keeping the stock price high in the short term. They have a lot to work with, it's a good company, but it's ultimately up to them. I think a good test is seeing what they do in the near future now that they spent 3 billion on buybacks. Again, a potential acquisition would be a very positive sign. But even then, they have a ton of other brands like Bang, Rain, Storm and so on, so what more can they do? Sure, this can grow, but to some degree they take the market share from Monster, so overall the growth may not be so high. I looked into Celsius in another episode and that one is, I think, a very interesting competitor. They have potential to grow and expand internationally and already have a pretty impressive market share. I see the two as uh, maybe Nike and Lululemon, with one being the well-established and uh, solid or reliable player, while the other is the underdog that uh, still has a lot of growth to prove. 
So, monster, an ok price for what they offer, but I wouldn't go for it at this level. They don't pay dividends, there is a lot of competition, maybe even some regulatory pressure in the future, so when balancing what I get for the risk they offer, this is not worth it right now. Maybe something like 15 times the cash flow should be an ok entry and then average down if they continue to fall. To balance the exposure to the industry, I'd maybe even pair them with Celsius, but uh, again, not at the current prices. But again, that's for me, you can have totally different targets. Now, NIO, this is a Chinese EV producer that saw a lot of attention from the market. Katie Wood even sold some Tesla to buy them after they had a rise and fall and then sold them at a loss to buy Tesla again. They had a huge jump some time ago, going from around 1 to as much as 60 in about a year and then falling back to the level from 2020. They are still a relatively big company, being valued at around 9 billion, which is quite a lot of money. The revenue is growing, but the net income and the cash flow are more and more negative. They have no profit margin and that's a very significant issue. If that's what they get with huge subsidies, then there is probably some big issue with the company. Something to keep in mind with any Chinese EV company is that they had a very good time with huge subsidies from the government, but in the future that will eventually stop being the case. The recent tariffs in the US and EU also mean a huge deterrent to a potential global expansion. But there is a lot of money to be made outside of those two, so there can still be potential. Obviously, not something that would make them a $150 billion company again, but they can still have some market share. They kept issuing shares when the price exploded, which was, in my opinion, a very good move. The number has pretty much doubled since 2020, so they really took advantage of it and the market. For a barely profitable or even unprofitable company at that time, this was a huge influx of capital. We can see that they are investing a lot lately, so they are doing something with the money. Another significant issue is the competition. With so many other Chinese EV makers and the legacy 50, 60, 80, 100 billion dollar companies, there is only so much a small company like NIO can do. You know, some of them have uh, 4 or 5 times more cash available than NIO's market cap, so we are talking about some huge competitors. They have enough current assets to cover the current liabilities and the total ones are ok, so they are in pretty good financial shape. But there is 2.9 billion in equity on a market cap of around 9 to 10 billion, so they aren't really cheap. For a reference, Stellantis, who's making in a year more than NIO is worth, has 82 billion in equity on a 50 to 60 billion market cap. For a company that's losing so much money, I'm not sure the growth potential, which is weaker now, is a good excuse. Will they get back to the 2021 prices? I think it's very unlikely. It's pretty much impossible to justify them being a 150 billion market cap company when Ford, VW and Stellantis are worth that much together. Sure, if the market hype is back, they can increase, but then they probably dilute you by 50% in a couple of years and it pushes your return further and further into the future. I think the current price is still a big bet on whether they can develop and make money in an environment that's more and more unfavorable for them. Yes, they can do it, but if we get into a recession in the next half a decade or China cuts the subsidies or something else happens, they could be in very big trouble. For me, this kind of risk reward is not worth it in the current market, but if you are willing to take the risk, I hope it works out for you. Now, SoFi or Social Finance is a personal finance and online banking company. The stock is down significantly from the IPO from a few years ago, which is pretty much the norm for the specs and IPOs from that time. We can see a very impressive growth story with an 8x in the number of members in 4 years. Same about the revenue, the EBITDA and even the net income that became positive in Q1. The report was well above the guidance thanks to extinguishment of debt in Q1 and overall they see about 170 million in net income this year. They are being cautious due to the current environment, which is not a bad approach. I think if they really want to grow, they can easily do it, but that would come with a lot of risk. I think it's better to get some stable 20-30% which they expect, which is still huge, but in a much more careful way, which the market doesn't seem to like. Financially, they are in a very good position, with the cash and investments well above the debt and other payables. You can see 5.8 billion in equity, but it's not really meaningful because they have loans and deposits related to clients. Overall, still a very good financial shape. 
They issued quite a bit of shares at, uh, I guess, relatively okay prices a year ago, but that's very significant dilution. It doesn't have to be a negative if they use that money right and we can see overall additions to the book value. It's better than getting debt today because of the high interest rate, but they have to be careful not to overdo it because that kind of dilution can easily eat your profits. Now, some insiders are selling, but the CEO is buying, so overall nothing really relevant. I'm normally not giving too much importance to this kind of activity because they usually got them as part of the salary and maybe they needed the money or they simply didn't want them. You know, as an employee, you already have a lot of exposure to the company and also having it potentially be the number one position in your portfolio may be too much. Buying on top of what you already get on the other hand is usually a positive. I think there is potential and maybe some rate cuts will stimulate the economy and could even accelerate the company's growth. I'm sure the market had extremely high expectations during the IPO, but now they are getting to an interesting territory. If they continue this kind of growth and maybe even expand outside of the US, the stock will likely follow. It's common with the pandemic hype IPOs to start at a very unrealistic price and then fall a lot and eventually the company and the stock get too disconnected from each other and this reverses. Buying it 4 times more than today when you had no idea what the company is able to do was crazy. But now, when they keep delivering very impressive growth and they start making a profit, this is a very different story. For now, I'll add them to my watch list and we'll do more research. I saw a bunch of spec or IPO hype companies in the same position and in some cases they are getting close to being even potential value investments. Now, first Pacific, this is from an investing point of view a Chinese holding company that has stakes in some of the largest food, infrastructure and telecom companies in Hong Kong, Philippines and Indonesia. This is basically the perfect package if you want exposure to the development of the region. They have about 5.2 billion of gross asset value, which is spread quite evenly between the three main branches. They have way too many things to cover in a quick video, but simplified, think about Nestle or Kellogg's plus infrastructure, telecom, mining and more. So again, basically all you need to gain from the region's development. We can see improving numbers in almost every branch of the business, with the profit increasing a lot in time. We saw them crash significantly due to the pandemic, but then going up like two times from that point, making the current dividend really attractive if you bought back then. Still, even now, a 6.5% yield is pretty attractive, especially given the very low payout ratio, so let's have a look into it. They made around half a billion recently, which is exceptional for a 2 billion market cap company. But you have to look at them from the perspective of a Chinese company and then they are pretty cheap but not something unheard of. The current assets cover the current liabilities and even if they have a bit of debt, the total assets are well above that. The equity is about 11.5 billion while the market cap is at 2, so you can see what I mean by pretty cheap. They are cheap from pretty much every point of view. Now, when they make so much money from their investments, they basically have three choices, pay back the debt, invest more or pay the shareholders. If they manage to find a balance between the three, they can develop and improve the balance sheet while paying very nice dividends. But a thing to remember is that the Salim group from Indonesia owns almost half of this company. This is basically their company, so if they want high dividends or a full focus on one thing and ignoring the others, even though I doubt they would do it, it's up to them. So we have a good and sustainable 6.5% dividend, a great cash flow and a good financial shape with some potential to develop at a pretty good price. On the other hand, there are the classic risks associated with China. Still, even for a Chinese company, they are pretty cheap considering the assets and the potential of the region. And on top of China, there is political and economical risk from the Philippines and Indonesia as well. Of course, I'm not buying them without knowing a lot more, but I'm adding them to the watch list and we'll do some more research. Still, a 6.5% dividend while waiting for a potential external catalyst to happen isn't terrible. I think getting exposure to three of the highest potential regions in Asia is definitely a plus, and they are focused on delivering some earnings and dividend growth. This is probably one of those, uh, let's say boring but likely profitable long-term investments, but they are affected by the fact that they aren't American. If they were to even get listed in the US or the American and European funds would focus on Asian companies again, we might see them getting back to the levels from 2013 or so. And I say this even though a lot of the institutions that hold it are North American. Again, it's a matter of the risk and reward potential you are willing to take. 
Keep in mind that with all these companies, it's a matter of the risk and reward potential you want. I try getting them below what I consider a fair value because I want a better potential, but for a majority of people, buying at fair value is the norm, and that's totally fine. Once again, a couple of pretty good companies and additions to the watchlist. If you want to see more, I have 8 other videos in the series that you can watch and more are coming in the near future. Make sure to leave a like and a comment if you have a suggestion or like any of these companies. As always, what I cover in my videos shouldn't be enough for you to make any investment decision, so please do your own research before investing in anything. If you want to see more videos like this one, please leave a like and even a comment to help me out and make sure to subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.